Second Chronicles tonight. Second Chronicles tonight. Second Chronicles tonight. Contrast two different kings. Second Chronicles. First Samuel, Second Samuel, First Kings, Second Kings, and First Second Chronicles. First Samuel, uh, Samuel, Kings, and Chronicles at one time, uh, way back, were all one book. And then they divided them, but Second Chronicles chapter twenty-eight. Second Chronicles chapter twenty-eight. Here we find Ahaz. The Bible says this that he was in verse one that he was twenty years old when he began to reign. And he reigned 16 years in Jerusalem, but he did not that which was right in the sight of the Lord, like David, his father, for he walked in the ways of the kings of Israel and made also molten images for Balaam. Now, he has a lot of problems, but his biggest problem was he wasn't willing to follow God and do what was right. We've said before that in the nation of Israel, the ten northern tribes, there was never a good king. They were all wicked and ungodly and did that which was not right. In the southern kingdom, the king of Judah and Benjamin, there were several, several good kings that did right. We're going to see the second one tonight, but Ahaz didn't do that which was right. And so notice down in verse uh, 16, says this, and oh, at that time, did King Ahaz, I'll get this, at, at, let me slow down, read over. At that time did King Ahaz send it to the kings of Assyria to help him. All right, so that's important. He sent to the kings of Assyria to help him. Instead of asking God, he sent to the kings of Assyria. For again, the Edomites had come and smitten Judah and carried away captive. The Philistines also had re, um, invaded the cities of the low country and of the south of Judah and had taken Bethshemosh and Agilon and, and so forth with the villages thereof and Timnath, the villages thereof. Now, for the Lord brought Judah, in verse 19, low because of Ahaz, king of Israel. For he made Judah naked and transgressed sore against the Lord. And Tiglath, I always say Tilgath Pil Pilsner, king of Assyria came unto him and distressed him, but strengthened him not. For Ahaz took away a portion out of the house of the Lord and out of the house of the king and of the portion and gave it unto the king of Assyria, but he helped him not. And in the time of his distress... Did he trespass yet more against the Lord? This is that king Ahaz. For he sacrificed unto the gods of Damascus, which smote him. Now, the, the gods of uh, the, 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 the Syrians attacked him. So he sacrificed to the kings of, of the gods of the Syrians. Because the gods of the, let me back up, which smote him. And he said, because the gods of the kings of Syria, help them. Therefore will I sacrifice to them that they may help me. But they were the ruin of him, of all Israel. And Ahaz gathered together the vessels, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So we see Ahaz here and, and uh, how wicked and ungodly he was. And instead of calling upon God to help, he sacrifices to the gods. And the Bible says, for we know that the gods of this world are nothing. They have eyes, but they see not. Having ears, they hear not. Having mouths, they speak not. That the gods of this world, Paul said, for we know that an idol is nothing. So Ahaz, instead of sacrificing uh, and, and seeking God, you know, if we were going to speak about something tonight, if it was our point tonight, about seeking God in the time of trouble. Um, what time I am afraid, I will call upon him. But that isn't what he has, has done. And the sad thing is that, that Ahaz could have clearly seen the blessing of God upon the lives of godly people. But instead, he revolted against God. 
And the Bible says this, it was the ruin of him. It ruined him because he sacrificed these other gods. And you stop and think tonight, we know that an idol is nothing and that, uh, that our God, that among the gods, and I, I say, say this way, but the Bible says, among the gods, there is no one, there's no one, there's no God like under our God. There is no God like under our God. Our God is the living God. Ahaz decides, I'm going to sacrifice to the Syrian gods because that, those gods help them. How silly and foolish was Ahaz? How silly and foolish are Christians sometimes when they, they look at the things of this life and this world instead of setting our affections on things that are above? It was the ruin of Ahaz. Now, it says in chapter 19, we're not going to, or 29, I'm sorry. Hezekiah began to reign when he was five and 20 years old, and he reigned nine and 20 years in Jerusalem. And his mother's name was Abijah. And verse 2, and he did that which was right. Turn my page. Right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that David, his father, had done. Now, Hezekiah does right. They do right. Boy, they fix the temple door, and man, they're going to sacrifice in the temple again. Uh, and they're getting ready for the Passover in chapter 30. And notice this, what it says in chapter 30. He, he, Hezekiah, I mean, he's down in Judah, but he's trying to get Israel to come. He's trying to get everybody to come. And it says then in verse, um, oh, we'll start, we'll look at verse uh, 10. So the post, the riders, that carried the proclamation that they were going to celebrate the Passover. So the post passed from city to city throughout the country of Ephraim and Manasseh, even unto Zebulun. But now notice the people's response to Hezekiah's invitation to come to the Passover. But they laughed them to scorn and mocked them. I read this today that 47% of preachers now support gay marriages. They evidently cannot read the Bible the same way we read it, but 47% support it. And you say, well, this is what God says, and, and people will mock and they'll laugh. That's just exactly what they did throughout all Israel. They laughed, and they, as it says there in that verse, they laughed them to scorn. Kind of like, you remember when, I can see the guy's name, Lot. You remember when the angels came to Lot, and Lot, and they said, we're going to destroy this place? And you remember that Abraham had, had pleaded with God, if there are just ten righteous people in Sodom, would you spare it? And God said, if there are just ten righteous people in Sodom, I would spare it. And Ab Abraham, in my opinion, had kind of calculated one of those things, trying to outsmart God. Abraham had probably calculated where there's Lot and his wife. There's the two daughters that aren't married. There's the daughters that are married. They've got sons, sons-in-laws, and there are probably some kids, so there are probably ten righteous people. But when Lot went to them and said that God was going to judge Sodom, they laughed him to scorn. They, they made fun of him because of his life. So they laughed him to scorn. But Hezekiah, they're going to go on with it anyway. It says in verse 15, Then they killed the Passover on the 14th day of the second month, and the priests and the Levites were ashamed and sanctified themselves and brought in the burnt offering unto the house of the Lord. And they stood in their place, after the manner according to the law of Moses, the man of God. The priest sprinkled the blood which they received of the hand of the Levites. Now, okay, so the, the Passover had not been kept. As a matter of fact, it'll say, um, yeah, I'll read it in a minute, but anyway, so they, they keep the Passover, but some of them are not cleansed to be able to celebrate the Passover. So notice verse 19. I like this. They, that prepareth the heart. Let me read verse 18. For a multitude of the people 
even many of Ephraim and Manasseh, Issachar and Zebulun, had not cleansed themselves, yet did they eat the Passover. Otherwise, then um, it was written. But now, so, look, you remember in Matthew 23, Jesus called the Pharisees a bunch of whited sepulchers. Because at the time of the Passover, they would whitewash the tombstones. Because if, they, if anybody touched the tombstones, they could not keep the Passover because they would be unclean. And so Jesus called them a bunch of whited sepulchers because on the outside they looked good, but on the inside they were full of dead men's bones. So these people kept the Passover. They weren't as set apart as they should be, but it had been a long time since it. But notice, but Hezekiah prayed for them, saying, the good Lord pardon every one. I like that. The good Lord pardon every one uh, that prepareth his heart to seek God, the Lord God of his fathers, though he be not cleansed according to the purification of the sanctuary. And the Lord hearkened to Hezekiah and healed the people. What they were doing was not right. But Hezekiah prayed a simple prayer. The good Lord pardon you. And God did. God looked down, saw that their heart was, their heart was right. Man, man looketh on the outward, but God looks on the inside. Their heart was right. And it tells us that they, uh, the, the, the Passover that they celebrated and the children of Israel that were present at Jerusalem kept the feast of unleavened bread seven days with great gladness. And the Levites and the priests praised the Lord day by day, singing with loud instruments unto the Lord. And Hezekiah spake comfort, comfortably, excuse me, unto all the Levites that taught the good knowledge of the Lord. And they did eat throughout the feast seven days, offering peace offerings and making confession to the Lord. God of their father. It says down just a little bit further, which we won't read, that there was great joy because they sought God. Unlike Ahaz, who decided, well, I'm going to sacrifice to the Syrian gods because the Syrian gods evidently helped them because I don't have anybody to help me. Hezekiah comes along and says, you know what? We're going to clean the temple up and we're going to sacrifice the Passover and we're going to keep the Passover. I understand that the people weren't quite prepared for the Passover, but... The good Lord pardoned them, and God did, because the people's hearts were in the right place. Now, Hezekiah has problems. The, uh, in verse chapter 32, Sennacherib invades Judah, and Sennacherib was the king of Assyria, and Sennacherib said, you know, who's going to help you? Who will help you? And he sought to terrify him, in verse 9, after this, did Sennacherib, king of Assyria, send his servants to Jerusalem, but he himself laid siege against Lachish, and all his power well, with him unto Hezekiah. And so they went, and they said, you know, Sennacherib said, what God's going to help you? There ain't any God going to help you. There have been no gods to help anybody. And so in verse 17, he wrote letters and, and he said in that verse 17, uh, shall, so shall not thy God of Hezekiah deliver his people out of my hand. So Nacarib says that, that God isn't going to help you. Ahaz says, I better sacrifice to the gods of the Syrians because I, I, they helped them and nobody's helping me. And, and so what am I going to do? And the Bible says it was the ruin of him. Hezekiah, on the other hand, has seen what God can do. And so Hezekiah prays in verse 29. Verse 20, I'm sorry. And for this cause, Hezekiah the king and the prophet Isaiah, the son of Amos, prayed and cried to heaven. Ahaz says, I'm going to ask this, the Syrian gods to help. Hezekiah and Isaiah said, 
we're going to ask God for help. And notice that in verse, the next verse, 21. And the Lord sent an angel which cut off all the mighty men of valor. Second Kings says 144,000 men died that night by the hand of God. Ahaz says, I'm not going to ask God. And it was the ruin of him. You know, we, we talk about praying, asking God for things and God to do things. Would you have thought, would you have thought, I'm serious, when we pray, we often ask God for something that is highly probable. We've used this illustration again, I need five bucks. Who's got five bucks in your man? No, I don't need five bucks. I need a lot of five bucks. Who can I ask? And we say, where could I go but to the Lord? Where could we go? Ahaz says, I'm going to try the, the Syrian gods. They helped them. Well, they didn't. And it was the ruin of them. Hezekiah said, called Isaiah and said, let's pray to God. We already know what God will do. And that night, the death angel went through the camp of the Assyrians and killed 144,000 of them so that the next day when they went out there, the whole camp, 144,000 of them were dead. They were corpses. Now, now, Sennacherib went back to the temple of his god, and they killed him there. It's a dangerous thing, really, to mock God. Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. That's why it's so important. That's why it's important for you and I. We, of all people, say, well, you know what? I believe God can answer my prayer. Really? You believe that? Do you really believe that? Say, well, amen, preacher, I really believe that. Amen. Ask and you shall receive. Keep on asking, keep on seeking, keep on knocking. There is a God in heaven who will answer our prayer, just like he did for Hezekiah. There are so many, there are too many Ahazes, not enough Hezekiahs, begging and asking God to do something for them. And it tells us that even a little bit later, Hezekiah got sick and he was going to die. Isaiah said, you're going to die. And Hezekiah turned his face to the wall and prayed. And God heard his prayer and told Isaiah, go back in and tell that guy he's going to live. And he lived another 15 years. Now, there was a problem with that 15 years because he died. And his son reigned at the age of 12. Manasseh. Wicked, ungodly Manasseh reigned in Israel. He made his sons, he offered his sons to the pagan god. I'm not sure about the prayer of Hezekiah. I'm not going to question it, but I'm just saying that in that 15-year period he lived, Manasseh was born. He was 12 years old. God does want to answer our prayer. God delights in answering prayers. When, when, it, 2 Chronicles 16.9 goes along with the good Lord pardon thee. The eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth, back and forth. The idea that the eyes of the Lord are looking constantly back and forth to show himself strong on behalf of them whose heart is perfect toward him. God wants to do for us. God will do for us. We just got to ask. Hezekiah the good Lord pardon thee. I know your heart's in the right place. You're, you're, you're outward. You may not be in the right place. Sanctum. But I know your heart's in the right place to seek God. And God said, okay, that's fine. We'll do that. Why? I'm trying to remember the verse. I'm memorizing this verse. For the Lord is gracious. That's how it is. For the Lord is gracious of great compassion slow to anger, and of tender mercy. That is the description of our God that we serve tonight. Father, we thank you again. Lord, here's a contrast between Ahaz and Hezekiah. Lord, what a difference in these two guys. One guy sought the pagan gods of Syria. Hezekiah sought thee. Lord, help our heart to be right toward thee tonight because the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man 
availeth much. Lord, we pray. Thank you for these that have come out tonight. And Lord, we pray that you'll bless us. Help us tonight, we pray. In Jesus' holy and precious and wonderful name, amen.